Good morning, church. Please stand and join us in worship this morning. fastball and here comes the big curve, right? I know, it gets you every time. It's okay. We made a deal, like she said that for sure she would high five me, so um, I, want, I got it both services. So uh, just, just really a quick, because I know this is like a little bit of a curveball, so some of you who have come here consistently are like all of a sudden, wait a second, this is different, what's going on? Um, just a little bit of a change, just to be perfectly honest with you, when I get up here and do announcements, most of the time it's not so much about announcements as it is, is I would really like to welcome you, especially visitors. Um, sometimes this is, uh, 
I don't know, coming to church can be uncomfortable. I'll be honest, it's a little intimidating sometimes. So um, I just wanted to mess with the rest of you a little bit. I'm kidding. That's not really the entire thing, but um, a little bit. We also wanted to, God is doing a lot in this church and in, in a lot of you. And so I want to encourage you to continue to share what God is doing. But we want to take some opportunity to do that during our, our prayer time and praise time uh, with Pastor Dave. So um, just switching up a little bit of things. My, my name is Doug Betts. I am the children and youth pastor here at Beloit First Christian Church. And so I do want to uh, welcome you. I'm glad you're here. It's awesome to see so many of you here this morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, I would like to remind you there is a register at the end of each row. If you would pick that up and, and sign that and pass that along. Um, if you have a desire to learn more about the church, you can mark that in the register. You can also stop by the uh, Welcome Center uh, located through those doors or visit with myself, Pastor Dave or Pastor Cliff. We'll be at the doors at the end of each service. Would love to visit with you, get to know you, pray for you for anything that you may have needs for um, as well. Uh, just a few announcements. One, Operation Christmas Child. I'm holding this uh, pill bottle, um, which I've been informed that if you fill this with quarters, it's exactly enough quarters to pay shipping for the Operation Christmas Child box, which is $9. Um, however, I don't know exactly how all that works, so I'm going to encourage you to check out the bulletin, but also, more importantly, to stop by the table right out there and visit with them as they will uh, share how we can make Operation Christmas Child work. Also, a reminder, they do have the drive-in, uh, shoebox drive-in fundraiser, which will be happening on September 29th from 5 to 7 p.m. here at the church. Um, and then also, just real quick, I wanted to mention divorce care and divorce care for kids because um, that's an area where, where we see God at work. And so if that is something that you have an interest in, um, I would encourage you to uh, investigate that a little bit. You can, again, find more information out at the Welcome Center or visit with one of the pastors. Um, we'd love to share with you um, a little bit about that also. That meets on Monday nights at 6.30 p.m. And then finally, uh, my last announcement, I'm going to close with CLASH, which is uh, our children's ministry. It stands for children's Lo Children Loving and Serving Him. For first graders through sixth graders, we meet on Wednesday nights uh, here at the church from 6 to 7. We had last week about 77 kids, first through uh, sixth grade, that were here. Um, it was awesome. It was kind of crazy a little bit, but it was still awesome. And, and I want to throw out to you, this week we're going to be discussing, um, we're going to be talking about why did God create me? And, uh, and so I want to throw this out to you. I've been mentioning it for several weeks. We do have a need for continued volunteers, and there are two specific areas um, that we need in both Clash and Fusion is small group leaders to just help with small groups. All of our small groups are, are hopefully designed to be facilitated by at least two adults. Um, and so we have some areas where we need uh, a, a small group helper, leader, whatever. Um, so if God is, is calling you in that, I'd love to talk with you about that. And the second thing is during clash from 6 to 7, a little bit before, a little bit after, uh, we have a need for child care. Um, I would love to be able to provide a place for our volunteers to have, that have little kids that aren't clash age to go and, and hang out and just have a place where the moms, dads, whomever, don't have to worry about them. So if you feel called to just spend about an hour and a half hanging out with some little kids. Um, that would be awesome, and we could use you for child care during class. I'd love to visit with you about that. Um, and then finally, I'm gonna transition us here into worship. I, I'd like to invite you, and I know that God does in, in different ways, but um, as we get set to, to worship, I'm so excited by these guys, they're awesome. Um, and as we get set to worship, I wanna encourage you to just let the Holy Spirit work in, in however he may in, in each of you. Um, and I know that, that you know, oftentimes we, we ask you to stand. And you know what? If God is calling you to sit and bow your head and go to prayer, and that's how you need to worship him this morning, I, I want you to do that. Um, we've been talking about 1 John in a lot of different places. We talked about it in Sunday school, too. Um, he talks a lot about love, John does. And, and so I want to encourage you um, that he, he uses and actually McKenna is going to read this for you here shortly, but he talks about we know love because Christ laid down his life for us, that we ought to lay down our life for others. And so I want to encourage you that that doesn't always mean, um, you know, laying our lives down for someone else's life. Sometimes it means laying down other things. And so I want to encourage you this morning, whatever it is that may be hindering you in your worship with God, maybe separating you, lay that down at his feet this morning. Um, whatever, whatever challenges you have, uh, lay those down at his feet. Whatever burdens are on your heart. Lay those down at the feet of Jesus. Whatever fears may be keeping you from worshiping this morning, lay those down at the feet of Jesus. Thank you. 
It can be so, so hard to lay your life down for the Lord, but when you do, great things can come out of it. And in 1 John 3, 16-18, it says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down all our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth.
Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your fierce love. Thank you for pursuing us. You're relentless in your pursuit for our hearts. And no matter how far away we run from you, no matter how many mistakes we make, no matter how many decisions we make that we know you would not like, you still love us and you still are chasing after us and you want us to be with you. Thank you, Lord, for your endless love. In your name, amen. Please be seated. At this time, we're going to release the uh, kids that want to go to kids' church. Uh, that's uh, grades kindergarten through fourth grade. If you want to go with Pastor Doug, they're going to be exiting to have a special program just for you. <coughs> Max Licato has said, and I quote, Fear never wrote a symphony or a poem. Fear never negotiated a peace treaty or cured a disease. Fear never pulled a family out of poverty or a country out of bigotry. Fear never saved a marriage or a business. Courage did that. Faith did that. People who refused to consult or cower in the timidity did that. But fear itself, fear herds us into a prison and slams the door. To get the Bible's perspective on fear for our prayer time today, I invite you to listen as I read Psalm 27, verse 1, which says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? What can we learn from these words from Psalm 27? In this passage, the psalmist David highlights three characteristics of the Lord, who he says is, first, my light, second, my salvation, and third, my stronghold. And these three characteristics of the Lord are the answers to the concern for fear that David had. Pastor Cliff is going to be talking more about fear today, but we should have that same confidence that the psalmist David had as we pray for our church family today. These spiritual truths should inspire our prayers to the Lord as a church family. We already have prayer joys and concerns that we shared in our earlier worship service, which we'll include in our prayer time. And uh, we have some items that have been turned in by card for prayers, and we'll include those. Some have been passed on verbally to the pastoral staff, but the, we welcome the things that you would share right now, joys and concerns and especially testimonies about what God is doing in and through your life and lives of other people. Whatever's on your heart, we want to share together as a church family as we pray together. What would you share as a prayer, joy, or concern? Yes, Teresa. Thank you for those things, a blessing, and also to pray for Paul's right shoulder. Other joys, concerns, and testimonies. We appreciate the things that are on your heart. Yes. sharing that. Keeping those guardian angels working overtime. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you for sharing that. Other joys, concerns, and testimonies, whatever's on your heart. Back there. Thank you for sharing that. We'll pray for your stepdad and for your mom as she supports him. 
other choice concerns and testimony whatever's on your heart we want to welcome your thoughts and you're going to lead us in prayer in just a minute yes That's super. They did a great job, and we're glad to have them uh, share us leading in worship. You're going to lead us in prayer in just a minute with a. I see a hand back there. Hey, we'll continue to pray for him. And uh, thank you for mentioning that to remind us and help us realize that uh, God is at work even all the way to Ohio to help with people in need. I'll lead us in prayer in just a minute with a pattern of prayer following the letters of the word ACTS. A-C-T-S is an outline in which uh, the A represents adoration or praise of God. C represents confession. T represents thanks, and S represents supplication or praying for others. I'm going to offer some suggestions as I'm praying, but I want to encourage you to pray on your own, however God prompts you in your own heart. Join me in your hearts as we pray together. As I'm praying, I invite you to express your own adoration or praise to God in your own heart, however he prompts you. We praise you, God Almighty. You are loving. You are sovereign. You're holy. And as the psalmist David said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You are our heavenly father. You do not change. You alone are eternal, everlasting, and exalted. No wonder we worship you. No wonder we praise you. Praise God. Praise God. continue on in our prayers to time to focus on the topic of confession. I invite you to talk to God in your own heart about your own life, however he prompts you. We pray, observing the pattern in Psalm 34, 4, where it says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. We need that, Lord. We need your touch and your help. God, I confess my sin. I repent. And I seek your mercy, washing, and cleansing. It's only by the blood of Jesus that I have any hope at all for forgiveness and cleansing. I don't deserve it. I can't earn it. I can't pay it back. It's only by grace. We move on in our prayers to a time to focus on giving thanks. I invite you to talk to God in your own heart, thanking him for whatever he prompts you to thank him for. Thank you, God, for this church family and the opportunity to share together on our spiritual journey. I pray that you allow us to help one another as we all need encouragement and we have opportunity to share encouragement. Be with us, we pray. We give you uh, praise along with Dina for the youth praise band and the musical gifts and abilities they have been sharing not only with the fusion group but uh, leading in worship today continue to bless and encourage them as they uh, offer their gifts we give you praise along with Bennett for your protection and provision for her when she had a tumble and fall thank you that she was not hurt more seriously and that uh, you were with her even in the midst of that challenge give you thanks along with Teresa for your provision for the ability to make some travel plans that she'd been working on for a period of time. Thank you for your uh, guidance that uh, she was able to complete those plans. We'll give you thanks and praise for the news we have received of the wedding yesterday of Mallory Whitstruck and Clint Shoemaker. Their wedding is September 22nd. We pray for them as they uh, uh, live out the commitment as husband and wife. Uh, guide them, guard them, direct them, keep them, we pray give you thanks along with her name Mason as she's anticipating good things for the see you at the pole uh, observance uh, this coming uh, Wednesday we pray that uh, many would be able to benefit from that and uh, we ask that your 
name would be praised and lifted up. Give you praise for the birthday today for Hazel Peterson. She's 101 at Hilltop uh, Nursing Home, and she welcomes visitors who would be able to stop by and greet her. Uh, thank you for Hazel's life and her influence and encouragement on this church family. Give you thanks and praise for Jeanette Luke's testimony in the earlier worship service that she uh, took a step of faith when she was prompted to reach out and help the young people, and uh, she uh, shared in her testimony that you touched her life even more than she was able to encourage the others, and uh, she encouraged the church family to be willing to be a channel for God to use them likewise. Thank you for the Christ ministry that started last Wednesday on September 19th, and we pray for the workers and helpers and students. Uh, be with all, and we pray for more people to help. Thank you for the Operation Christmas Child shoebox program and for the fundraiser and the opportunity to anticipate preparing boxes to make a difference. We give you praise that next uh, Sunday, the Heart Choices Walk Run for Life will be September 30th. As we move on to another focus of prayer for supplication, I invite you to uh, pray in your own heart praying for others however he prompts you we do pray overall Lord that you would help those who are in need some need your touch physically other emotionally some people need your touch relationally some people need your touch spiritually some of us need all those things help provide the hope and healing that you are the one that can provide for those for whom we pray we just ask for your touch in a special way. We pray along with Ellen Meyer for Adrian Meyer as he'll be having back surgery in Oklahoma City soon. Uh, be with him and help him from that procedure. We pray along with Teresa for Paul's right shoulder for complications that have not responded to treatment so far. Help him, deliver him. We pray along with Angela for her stepdad for health concerns and pray for your touch. Give the doctors and nurses wisdom and be with Angela's mom as she seeks to be in support. We pray along with Micah, uh, giving you praise that her, his father-in-law is doing well after heart bypass surgery, and we pray for Gary Wallace as he heals in Ohio after that surgery recently. Help him, we pray. We uh, um, pray for your touch on others that need your presence. We pray that you would help us as a church family to not fear, but to trust your character. We pray for Roger Thielander as he recovers after being in the hospital last week and as he anticipates some medical procedures this next week, be with him. We pray along with Judy Stroop for her son, Thomas Chris, for health concerns. We pray for Daryl Fulhag as he continues chemo treatment several times a week in Salina. Be with uh, Lee Peck's daughter, Jessica Reimer, as she faces cancer that has come back again. Give them wisdom and help her, we pray. We pray for Lorna Jones as she recovers after a fall. Be with Dennis Luchin as he heals in California after heart bypass surgery. Be with uh, Louise Sutton's nephew, Doug Dillner, as he battles medical complications, preparing for a possible double lung transplant. We just pray that you would be with him. Be with Pastor Cliff as he shares your word today. Fill him, anoint him, use him, allow him to be a channel of your truth, and may your spirit be present to prompt the heart <coughs> of each of us to know how we can apply your word to each of us on our spiritual journey. We want to remember the families of those who have experienced passing of loved ones. We pray for the family of Keith Williams' dad, Virgil Perry, commonly known as Grampy Williams as he passed away September 13th. We pray for the family and friends as they will remember Grampy and his life and influence at a memorial service October 13th. Send comfort and peace, we pray. Pray for the family of Bonnie Gaskell and Floyd as she passed away and pray for the concern that Diane Coleman shared for a family that has lost a mother. Send comfort and peace, we pray. And prompt us, we pray as we may have contact with some of these families that we could reach out with love and support and care to let them know that they do not stand alone, but that we want to be with them in their need. Lord, I ask for your peace to enter and for fear to leave. I ask for the absence of fear in my mind, my heart, my soul, my 
thoughts and my words. I ask for deep faith to flood the fearful places of my heart that I would remember your power and faithfulness in the moments of fear. Keep the evil one away and draw near as your promise in James 4, 8, as I draw near to you, Lord, draw me near to you, I pray. All these things in the blessed name of Jesus, my risen Lord and Savior, amen. Good morning. While the deacons are coming forward to help us with our communion meal, I uh, just want to give a few, a few instructions. Uh, we are going to partake in communion. And as the deacons pass out the elements, we encourage everyone to join us in that. The only requirement is that you are a firm believer of Jesus Christ, that you count him as your Lord and Savior. And uh, then just hold the elements and we'll take it all together as a family. Um, the praise team led us in uh, a call to worship with a verse out of 1 John. I had already picked one in 1 John also. This is from uh, 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That means we, we can give it all to him, can't we? It's a great thing. I also want to share one other one. This one is from Psalm 103, verse 12. It says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. So how far is the east from the west? It's infinity, isn't it? It's like forever. It goes on forever and ever. Okay, with that thought in mind, about infinity, I got, a, I got a pop quiz for you. What day was Wednesday? I don't want the date of the, I don't want the date. What day was Wednesday? Anybody know that day? It was the Day of Atonement, the most sacred day for the Hebrew people. Day of Atonement. So what was the, with the Day of Atonement? Why would that be so special? Remember, this is before Jesus came to set us all free. And that was the day that the Jewish people believed that they could come before God and make atonement. Well, actually, the priest had to make the atonement for them so that they could be closer to God. They'd become a little bit more holy that day. Well, how far do you think it is from God's holiness to our sinful nature? It's infinity, isn't it? It's like forever. The east and the west, it just goes on. Well, the good news is that God, God, you know, well, first of all, I want to back up and say, on the Day of Atonement, so one way to symbolize that, you know, the priest would go in behind the, 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 the great veil, the, behind the curtain, and give the sacrifices, blood sacrifices. And then, so all the people could see, because they couldn't see what went on behind the curtain. He would take a ribbon, and he would tie the ribbon on the goat, and he would send that goat off hoping it would go to infinity, right? Because we want, the, you know, that ribbon was our sins. And he put it on that goat and said, get out of here. Because the people didn't want to see their sins anymore. That was the day of atonement. I don't know that the goat ever made it to infinity, but we certainly didn't want to see that goat, did we? And now God gave us the wonderful gift of his son to take those sins, to bridge that gap so that it's not so far that we can't see each other, God and us. He wants us. The praise team spoke of his love, his unrelentless pursuit. And that's what we get to celebrate today. So yeah, it's a great sacred holy day for the Jewish people, but it's a day of atonement every single day for us, isn't it? We get to celebrate it anytime we want, and we're going to do it right now. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for the gift that you gave us the gift of atoning, atoning for our sins. And you gave that through your son, Jesus Christ, that we could be with you and live with you forever and ever. God, you love us so much that you would do that. And so we take this time to remember that time and that effort that you gave. And Lord, we just want to give back to you and say thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you've done for us. Lord, I pray that you would bless this time of remembrance and that you would bless and touch people's heart to remember the things that you've done for us. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.
Gospel of Luke, he recounted the last supper that Jesus was able to share with his disciples. And he says this in the 22nd chapter, verse 19 and 20. He says, and he took the bread, he gave thanks and he broke it, and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Thank God we have a new covenant, right? No more goats running around with ribbons in their hair. Yeah, I like that. We now have a time to give back to, to uh, the, the Lord in the way that he directs us. And what do I always say? Give what the Holy Spirit tells you to give. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're now filled with the Holy Spirit. So listen to him. Be directed by him and then be obedient. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to have this time that we can give back we thank you, Lord, that you have created us to be stewards of the things that you've given us. You haven't given us commands. You just simply let us do the things as you direct. So we love you, God. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for the fact that your Holy Spirit can be a guiding light in us. And I pray, Lord, that you would help um, us to be re responsive and obedient to that direction and help us to do as you would do. In Jesus' name, amen. A little video for you while we have the offering. Sometimes I think, what will people say of me when I'm only just a memory? When I'm only in my soul belongs. Was I loved? No one else would show up. Was I cheated? to the least of us was my worship more than just a song
Hey, good morning, church. It is so good to have you out. Again, I want to thank you for coming out, uh, making the time and effort to be here to worship with us. Uh, We're glad that you're here. We hope we get a chance to visit with you. Um, Hey, before I get to our text, can I just, all of our praise team, none of our praise teams um, get up here and do it for applause. Um, They do it to lead. But can I just uh, encourage our youth praise team right now? Can you help me encourage our youth praise team, um, because uh, the Bible says we should build each other up and encourage one another. And if you thought they did a great job in leading us this morning, could you let them know that? I I just want you guys to know that I know that you have gotten a really good taste of how God loves you and the fierce love that he has for you. But I also want you to know the way that you're responding to his love is impacting us it's really stirring our hearts as well so god's using you Um, just keep pursuing him he's he's definitely with you Um, uh, if you have a bible i want to get to our message this morning it's uh in the book of acts Um, it's in your new testament you can uh, uh, find it there in your own bible or up on the screen we'll have it so you can follow there too we're in acts chapter 5 and we're looking at verses 12 through 42 today so a little bit longer passage Um, we are working our way through this book of acts And we said, when we started this series, we said, sometimes this book is misnamed. Some people call it the Acts of the Apostles. Um, And this is a book that basically follows what happens um, after Jesus has been uh, crucified, after he's been raised from the dead, and after Jesus ascends to heaven, he sends the Holy Spirit to live inside of his followers, inside of his uh, church. And then the book of Acts shows the acts of Jesus in the Holy Spirit or through the Holy Spirit in his followers. And so this is really about what Jesus is doing. Um, And he continues to work in this early church here in Jerusalem. This is we're still following the believers who are primarily in Jerusalem yet at this point. Um, But as I read this, just remember, this is God's word and follow along as I read. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. And as a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. And then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. And at daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. And when the high priest and his associates arrived, They called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. And so they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked, with the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. And then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. And at that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. And yet you have filled Jerusalem 
with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior so that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And when they heard this, they were furious, and they wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. And then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thutis appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and all his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. And his speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. And then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. And day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Let's take a moment to pray. Thank you, Lord, for your presence here among us. By your Holy Spirit, we pray that uh, these words that we've just read, it's your word, Lord, uh, that you would speak to us now. Help us to understand. Help us to grasp uh, what you're saying to us so that it's personal, it's powerful, it's real, um, and that it's life-changing. Help us not to leave here today the same way that we walked in. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've been kind of tracking in this series, I, you know, last week I mentioned this, I'll just as a refresher, um, we talked about fear of the Lord a little bit, and, and we're actually going to explore fear just a little bit more here today from this text, um, because I think there's actually a lot of fear that's happening um, in what we've just read. Um, fear, in, in kind of the most basic sense, is just this, um, this thing that arises within us whenever you and I feel that something that we value is being threatened. Uh, when that happens, when something that we value is being threatened, um, fear arises. There's this sense of anxiety, this worry, or there's lots of actually different responses that we'll look at. But I want to start this morning by making this as clear as I can, because I think this is a crucial starting point for us. Um, a lot of times when we read these texts, I've said this before, we tend to think, these guys are just kind of superhuman, superhero, super Bible heroes, you know, and they just kind of go through these things. Well, they, they just got beaten, and they're rejoicing. They go home rejoicing. I, I just want to tell you that uh, that's true. They go home rejoicing, but I want to say that what they experienced was also a great amount of fear. Um, because when it says that at the end of our text, that it says that they let them go, but before they let them go, they flogged them. Uh, you understand what that means, that in the first century, uh, this was a, a, a weapon, a tool of torture. It was like a shortened whip that someone would have that would come out in three um, leather straps. And some of you know this from when Jesus was flogged. Uh, they would have variations on this. Some of these would have bits of rock um, or stone embedded 
into these leather straps so that they would rip the skin just a little bit more. Now, we don't know exactly what kind of flogging that the uh, disciples received in terms of that, but we know at the very minimum, um, it's these three leather straps that are attached to one cord as they are stretched out, shirt taken off, and then beaten. And the law in the Old Testament said that you could not give a flogging to someone more than 40 hits. And so it became practice in the first century that the religious leaders said, well, sometimes it's hard to actually keep count when you're flogging someone. We don't want to break the law, so it became customary to give someone 39 lashes in a flogging. And so we know that the disciples would have received 39 lashes with these leather uh, whips on their back. And I just want to tell you, they're human, and they were afraid. But there was something else happening in their life that was greater. Um, so when you think about fear, there are different responses. Psychologists help us think about these responses. Some of you know this. Psychologists have told us that there's, there's at least three basic responses. When we become afraid, um, that's sort of that, that flight or fear or fight. You ever heard the flight or fight kind of response and also a freeze kind of response? Think about it this way. If you and a friend go to Colorado and you go hiking up in the mountains, beautiful hiking trails, and as you're hiking along with your friend, suddenly out of nowhere pops this huge bear, huge, very hungry looking bear. He's right in your pathway. Your response, f fear arises because one of the things you value is your life, and so you're like, I I'm afraid here, I've got some fear. And one of the responses could be flight, because you might turn to your friend and say, run, right? And so you start running in the opposite direction. And as you're running, you know, you're praying all along the line. You say, oh, Lord, make me faster than the bear. Lord, make me faster than the bear. And Lord, if you can't make me faster than the bear, make me faster than my friend back here. So all along the way, your first response to fear could be just to distance yourself from the thing that is threatening you. That's one response to fear. Another response to fear is the fight. So let's say you and your friend are still hiking and you come across the bear and you turn to your friend this time and this time instead of saying run, you say, we're going to have to fight him. Let's fight him. And so you, you turn to the bear and try to be, be as, as intimidating as you possibly can and, and all along the way you're praying, oh Lord, make me stronger than the bear. But in true servant leadership fashion, you say to your friend after you, you know, you fight him first and we'll see what happens. And, and sometimes the response to fear is to fight in fact, let me just toss this in. Some people who are really angry people, I just want to tell you, they are fearful people. If, if there's an angry person in your life, or if you're angry, I want to tell you what's behind the anger is fear. It's just another response to fear. Sometimes we want to run away. It's a flight. Sometimes we want to fight. So anger is another different response to fear. But then there's the freeze response. And that is you and your friend here, you come across the bear, the bear's standing there, and this time you turn to each other and you say, play dead. Boom. And you both are going to drop to the ground and do nothing really except just kind of lay there. And this is where the bear actually starts praying and saying, Lord, I thank you for this food that you've prepared for me this day. And, and you have this response of fear that paralyzes you. Like, I, I, I don't know what to do. And I know that's a really tough place to be. No matter what fear uh, you're facing, the question is what kind of response to the fear? Because everybody, everybody is afraid. Everybody. And I say this because there's a fourth response. Not all psychologists will tell you this one, but the scriptures will. The response that you see these folks who have just gone through one of the scariest harrowing experiences where they thought they were going to die because that's what they wanted to do. We're going to kill them. They change their mind, they're going to go ahead and they flog them. They come out of that experience rejoicing. It's not because they're masochists and, oh, I really enjoyed that, or not because it, it didn't really hurt. It just kind of, you know, I got an itch back there, and can you scratch that with another stroke on the, on the thing? No, it's this, we were scared. But faith does not mean that you're not scared. Faith, if some of you have this idea that if you're fearful, you can't possibly have faith. That if I am fearful, I'm disqualified for faith because faith must mean I don't feel any fear. But today what I want to try to point out to you is that faith is a response to fear. 
In fact, some of the most faithful things you will ever see about in the scriptures or in life right around you here in testimonies are people who will say, I was so scared. My knees were shaking. My heart was pounding. The adrenaline was flowing. But I obeyed anyway. That is faith. Obedience in spite of fear, not without fear. It is having that fear, but then saying, but there's something else happening. Now, to kind of help us see this a little bit, let me reflect off of these. I think there's all of these responses to faith are in our text. And I think it'll help us to see what faith looks like in the face of fear. The first response that I see is flight. Because in our text, it says, you have these early disciples who are meeting in Jerusalem, um, and they're actually still going to the temple. Remember, these are all primarily Jewish Christians, that is, Jews who've now seen that Jesus is the Messiah, they still go to the temple daily, it says. They still go there to, to worship, but also to gather and meet. So when you think of the temple in the first century, it's not just one building. You, you understand that when the, the scriptures talk about the temple, it's actually a complex. It's actually 35 acres of buildings and courts and one of the courts that they were meeting at, these Christians were, they'd go to the temple, but then they would gather at Solomon's colonnade, or it was a, a portico, it was basically a porch area. And they would gather on the steps there, and they would, they would worship and sing and, and fellowship together over Jesus. And, and as that's happening, people are noticing. See, because a lot of other people are at the temple. But they see this group. You see that group over at Solomon's colonnade all the time? Yeah, I mean, I... I, they're always there first before I can get there for lunch or something. You know, they're always getting out first. And they're, they're, but I've noticed something when I go by. One, they notice it because it says in our text, there's lots of healings going on. It's not just one person happened one time. Healings are happening. Like lives are being restored. They're talking about a forgiveness that runs so deep in their lives that they are just absolutely filled with confidence that they have fellowship with God. They're talking about Fellowship with one another. And did you notice those Christians when they're gathering? Like it crosses all of these boundaries. Like they're from different, there's some rich and there's some poor. There's some educated and there's some not so educated. There's men and women. There's young and old. They're like all together. It doesn't make any sense to me, but what I'm seeing is really, really attractive. Like, like I, I see something there that I want, but here's the telling thing. What does it say in verse 13? No one dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. They didn't join them. Why? Fear. They're afraid. Because even though all these great things are happening, they also know it is inherently dangerous to get connected to this group because we already know the religious leaders are unhappy with them. And you know what that means? In the first century especially, I'm a Jewish person, and if the high priest, and if the Sadducees, and if the, the chief leaders of the people, if the Sanhedrin excommunicate me out of my Jewish synagogue, that's not just I can't go to church kind of deal. That means I lose, I'm out of community. That means I'm not allowed anymore to have connection to family, friends. That means my business is going to suffer because no one's going to come to my business when I'm tossed out of the synagogue. That means economically, relationally, in every way, all the things I value are at risk if I say I'm with them because they're with Jesus. And that risk causes their fear reaction to be what? Distance. Uh, I don't want to get too close to them. And yet there's something, there's something there that is compelling, attractive. I said this at the first service and kind of a, a little secret I've been keeping from my wife, but now she'll know. It's not really a secret when you preach about it, I guess, but here you go. I've, I've mentioned this before at various times. I have this, I don't know why, I have this weird desire to skydive. I've never skydived before, I, but it's just, I don't know why. So honey, it's just secretly, and Laura's not really thrilled about this idea, just so that you know, but, but secretly, I've been going and, and online just kind of seeing what the whole process is, like what's involved with it. Um, and, and more than that, I'm, re I'm really enjoying this, reading people's first time experience of skydiving. Um, I I've asked this every time I, I talk about that. How many skydivers in here have ever skydived? Yeah, and I know Ryan, Ryan has told me this there, yeah, there, and, 
and a few of you have, and more people at the first service who didn't raise their hand but, but told me secretly, I did, I went skydiving, I don't know if they're in trouble with somebody, but, but they told me that, and I'm like, what, what's that like? So I'm reading online people's written experiences of what it was like to go skydiving for the first time. And what's amazing to me is what I find in common, even though these are people all over the nation and world actually, but they're saying the first time I went skydiving, this was what it was like, and it's real similar. Here are the similarities. They say, when you want to go skydiving, you go to this place, obviously that's going to do it. And he said, the first thing you do is that you go into this um, kind of um, area where you have to start signing lots and lots of forms. Yeah, like insurance forms and liability forms, and if you die and you get smashed, you're not going to hold us liable. And, and so you're signing all these forms, and he's, all of them said this, and you have to pay in advance. Like, you've got to pay up front, I guess, if something goes bad. So... They get paid up front. He said, th then they all said, from there you go into this other area, bigger tent, where there's one instructor who's talking to everybody who's going to go skydiving, and he begins to share all the different things that are going to happen. And he tries to build you up a little bit and pump you up. Some of them said that them, this music is pounding and kind of gets your, your courage up. But he also talks about if your chute doesn't open, that kind of stuff, which... If he doesn't know if it's going to open, I don't know who is, but that would kind of freak me a little bit. But they said, but then really quickly from there, they move you outside of this tent so that you can see, because this is near the landing area, that you can see people who have already jumped and they're coming down in their parachutes. And, and he, he said, it's amazing because people are, are describing, they're like, that looks great. That looks fantastic. People are coming down, and when they get out of there, th and, and by the way, the first time usually is what they call a tandem jump. That is, they strap you to another person who's a real skydiver, and they're st the, that person's strapped behind you. You're strapped onto them, and so they're kind of in control. And so they said as soon as people get down, they get unstrapped. They are just glowing and beaming. Oh, this was like the best experience of my life. So all these first-timers who've never gone yet are hearing people saying, this is fantastic. And they're like, yeah, I, I think I really do want to go through with this. And then they said from there... They go ahead and they, they take you into another tent where now you're matched up one-on-one -on -one with the tandem person, the, the skydiver they're gonna, that's going to strap to you. He goes through all the things. He, he makes sure that your straps are on correctly. He talks you through the process. Then you hop on the plane. And then they said it seems like it takes a long time because you get to about 12,500 feet before you're going to drop. It takes a while to get up there. Once you get up there, they open the door. And all these people, first-time experience, they're like, it's funny, this came across. They said, most of everybody's been in an airplane before. But most of us have never been in an airplane with the door open while it's flying at 12,000 feet. And so they said this, this kind of this new experience is like, wow, this is not right. You shouldn't have a door open. And then, of course, people are going up to it and they're jumping out. And they said, when your time comes, it's amazing because you're in the front. The guy's strapped behind you. So that means, guess who's at the very edge of the plane when you're ready to jump out? You are, and if you're looking down, you're like, what did I get myself into? And then, for a lot of them, they said, their instructor said, I'm going to count to three. One, two, and then on two, they jumped instead of three, because they said, if you wait to three, most people put their arms out and try to grab something. On two, they jump out, and they said, for that brief moment, right on the edge, there's absolute terror. That's the way they're describing it to me. I have made a huge mistake. I want to change my mind. This is, I'm going to die. This is horrible. And the, the most extreme terror that some of them have ever experienced in their life. And then almost without fail, they said in a matter of two seconds, on the other side of their greatest terror and fear was the most exhilarating joy they have ever experienced. And I thought about that. I was like, on the other side of fear, in fact, the higher level the fear is, on the other side of that is the greatest joy. And so I, I was thinking about that because I'm looking at these people here in our text, and they see, and, and I just would say this, I know that, I don't know where everybody's at, but I know that some of you see and hear what we said about Jesus so often. You, you know what we're saying, but you, it's from a distance. It's, it's like, yeah, I, I love the blessings, I love the idea of forgiveness and cleansing and, and being close and having a community and having blessings of healing and restoration happening in my life. I love all that, but it's really, really scary for me, the thought of actually taking the plunge and giving, surrendering my life to Christ. And there's a part of you that say, can I just have the blessing? Can I have that joy without 
having to face that fear. And I, I got to tell you, you, you can't. There, there's no way that you can say, Jesus, I just want what you can give me, but not have you. But I want to tell you, as scary as it is to get to the edge and say, I'm, I'm going to give him my life, that on the other side of that fear is the greatest joy you will ever know. And if your fear is keeping you right where these folks are at, uh, we don't dare take that plunge. I just want to encourage you today. Faith knows that there's fear, but on the other side of it, the greatest joy. Here's the other part, fight. Look at the response of fight in fear. It says that these religious leaders were filled with jealousy, verses 17 and then 26. They're filled with jealousy. What, what is jealousy? It's another form of anger. It's basically saying, look, you are threatening my significance. We are religious leaders. We have power, position, control, respect from people, and you are challenging that because people are going to you. They see something they see in you that they don't see in us. That makes us feel smaller, lesser. And so it says that they are jealous. The funny thing about significance, when we try to get our sense of if I said, how many of you feel okay about who you are? Most of the time, that for us reflects what people are telling us. If you have people in your life who are telling you you're no good, you're not good enough, or you fall short, or you always fail, you're always a screw-up, you always, you tend to not feel real good about yourself, don't you? And the funny thing about significance is, it's a two-edged sword when we seek our primary sense of significance, my worth, my value as a person from other people. Because if they give it to me, oh, you're fantastic, oh, awesome, you're great. If only I had a nose that big, Cliff, you know, it'd be fantastic, you know, you're awesome. If people were saying that stuff to you, you're like, that's great, but the second that they don't give it to you, the second you don't get that significance from people, they not only become somebody who disappoints you, they become a competitor. They actually become somebody that you become jealous of. It's a two-edged sword when I try to get my significance from people because they won't always give it to me. That's why Shakespeare, you ever wonder what jealousy says? It's the, the green-eyed monster of jealousy. That actually comes from Shakespeare. Shakespeare called jealousy the green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on which actually captures that whole idea. I need from people, but at the same time, they are competing for my very significance. That will never work. Hollywood has a slogan, too. In Hollywood, they say, everyone wants, you to, everyone wants to see you do good, just not better than them. That's, that's Hollywood's way of going about significance. That's our culture's way of finding significance. The fear of that, the fear of losing that, brings out anger. It brings out jealousy. It says, oh, I'm going to have to get it. And if that means crushing you, destroying you, then so be it. We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us look bad, to make us look guilty of this man's blood. Then there's the freezing aspect. You just kind of get frozen in your fear. That happens here too, I think. It says they, they were at a loss when they put him in jail, and next thing you know, they go for him and they're gone. Jail's still locked. Everybody's still guarding there, but they're gone. And they have no clue what's happening, even though, this is interesting, they're trying later on to sort out, is God doing something here or not? Now, maybe you have to be a rocket scientist, but I don't think so. If somebody disappears from a securely locked cell, if people are getting healed miraculously, if all of that's attached there, maybe God's at work here. But when they come down to that question, they are so indecisive, they don't know what to do. In fact, at the beginning, they're like, we're going to kill him. Then one guy says, well, maybe God's at work. You never know. And they're like, yeah, okay, we won't kill him. Maybe we should just let him go. Well, we'll beat him. That, which, by the way, if that's, <laughs> if that's their version of just let him go and don't do anything to him, I don't know. They're just like... We can't quite make up our mind here whether God's at work or not. In fact, they might ask the question, how would you know? How do you know if God is really at work or not? It's tough to live in a fear of not knowing. Like, how do you have confidence that God's speaking to you? There was a, a missionary conference in Houston in 1999, 
There's a pastor who helped bring a number of African pastors over to the U.S. for this conference. And while they were in Houston, the African pastor said, well, you know, we want to kind of get to know the city a little bit, see American life. We want to go shopping, you know. So they said, we'd, we'd like to go out on our own. And, and this, uh, this pastor who brought him over, she said, uh, I was a little nervous, she said, because I, I figured they're going to get lost in Houston. They, they don't know where they're really going. But she said, here's what I'll do. She said, I'm going to give you guys my phone number. So if you get lost, just call me, and, and I'll, I'll make sure I get to where you're at, and we'll help you out. And they're like, okay, okay, great. And so they, they go off. An hour later, she gets a phone call, and one of the African pastors says, I am lost. I don't know where I'm at. She's like, don't worry. She said, and this is back in 1999. This is a little before uh, cell phones really took off, but she, she said, you're at a pay phone. Yeah, put the phone down. Go outside, and she said, at the street corner where there's two streets, look up, you'll see street signs, the names of the streets. She said, look at the names of the streets, then come back and tell me what streets that you're on. She said, I'll, then I'll know exactly where you're at, and I can come get you. He said, okay, puts the phone down, he goes back out, comes back in. She says, did you see the street? Yeah, he said, she said, well, where are you? He said, I'm at the corner of walk and don't walk. <laughs> She's like, well, that's probably not going to help me too much here. <laughs> How many of you feel in your life that you've ever been at the corner of walk and don't walk? Like, God, I want to do what you want. I just don't know. And can I ever know? Can I ever have a confidence in understanding what, you're, what you want in my, in my life? It's interesting because when we get to those points, we're like, yeah, if only God would give me a sign. Because you're like, well, look at the disciples. They had super confidence when God took them miraculously out of the jail what God wanted them to do. Because the angel says to them, go very next morning into the temple, preach and teach. Even though they just told you not to do that, go and do that. And some of you are like, well, yeah, Cliff, if an angel came to me and told me what to do, I would not have this doubt of what God wanted me to do. But I want to tell you, don't be so sure. For one thing, their confidence is not because an angel told them. It's not. Their confidence is not because some... Paul himself said in the Galatian, his letter to the Galatians, he says, you know what, the gospel I preach to you, if one day an angel, imagine this, supernatural angel, awesome and mighty, just beaming, you know, light beams coming off of me. Every time an angel shows up, people are passing out. That always happens. They're so scared. If an angel, Paul says, ever comes to you supernaturally, and you have a great supernatural experience, and the angel tells you something that does not jive with what Jesus told you, don't believe it. That's what he says in the book of Galatians. He says, I don't care what kind of supernatural experience you have. You can't have your confidence based off those kinds of experiences. Why were the disciples so confident to go right back out into those temple courts and preach and teach? Because that, what the angel told them, sounded just like what Jesus told them. That's how they knew. The confidence comes from God's word where they say, Jesus himself told us, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Jesus himself told us, when we do that, we're going to get persecuted. Jesus himself told us all of these things. Now there's an angel who tells us, it sounds just like Jesus. There's our confidence. Not in the angel, but in the word of God. That's where the confidence comes to overcome fear. That's why in the Bible, and I know, on the practical level, some of you are like, well, I, I get that in the big sense, but when I have a tough decision and it could go either way and it's not, one's not an obvious sin, how do I know? And this beautiful thing that God says, I'm with you and in whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So God gives great freedom even in his will to say, I'm giving you some freedom here and don't you ever worry or doubt that I somehow will check out on you because you took this turn or made this decision. If you're doing it for the glory of God, there's a great confidence that overcomes being so frozen in your fear that you are afraid to make any decision because you say, well, I don't want to mess up. Well, that's a response to fear, freezing, but there's a better response of faith. Do you understand that why the disciples could respond to fear? They had fear, but they responded in faith is because when somebody said, we're going to take away all your blessings, you got, I find this ironic, the disciples are healing people. That's what it says at the beginning of our text. Guess who ends up in the worst physical shape at the end of our text? The disciples, the apostles. 
They've got their backs bloodied and beaten. They are basically saying, you can take away our blessings. You can take away the physical. God is healing, and if you think you can just take that away, well, you can take away my physical health, but my blessing in health is not my greatest treasure. The reason I can have a confidence and a response to the fear in me about with faith is that my greatest treasure is Christ. Oh, and that's right. You can't beat him out of you can't beat Christ out of me. You can't take him away from me. You can take all my other things, my physical health, my my possessions, all of those things, but you can't take my greatest treasure. The reason that significance for them is not bound up in what people think of them is because they say, because there's actually my first love is speaking into my life every morning. Every day, God is speaking into my life and he is saying, you are incredible. You are my son. You are my daughter. I love you with a fierce love. I love you passionately with unending love. And this is the God who says, you're so amazing. You're so valuable. You have such worth in your life. Yes, I died for you, willingly. And when I hear that, does it hurt when other people don't lift you up and build you up? Yes, it's always going to hurt. I don't care how long you walk with Jesus. If somebody criticizes you, it hurts. But it doesn't have to control our lives anymore because now we have someone greater than that who's speaking the truth about who we are. And so they say, you can't take my significance away. If you think you can derail us by putting us in the public jail, by the way, means shame, dishonor, that's not going to touch our significance because it's not in that. And our confidence, you can't take our confidence because our wisdom is not in what other people say or even angels say, it's in what he says, the word of God. You see this over and over that the confidence that they have comes a faith comes in the face of fear because of who Christ is to them. That's why I love verse 14. I'll close with this. Verse 14 says, nobody dared join them, but nevertheless, that's a great word, isn't it? Nevertheless, lots of men and women did join them. Lots of men and women did believe. Lots of men and women got up to the very edge and they said, I know this is crazy, I got a lot of fear, but I'm, t I'm taking the plunge. And they jumped right in. Lots of men, nevertheless. See, that's what fear. Fear, nevertheless, that's faith. I'll close with, every time I see these texts and people are suffering for Jesus, and we have it, we're very blessed. Nobody's worried about the government coming in and stopping us from worshiping there this morning. But we have brothers and sisters right now who are dying because they're believers. So in Iran, in Iran, the public policy of Iran, the government policy is that Christianity is a recognized and they say protected religion. What that means though on one service is not at all what actually happens. In fact, Christians are persecuted very badly in Iran and it's illegal to try to convert a Muslim and 90 to 95 percent of Iran is Muslims to Christianity. If you are found to have converted somebody, it's punishable by death. Lots of other countries have this uh, same kind of persecution happening. But in Iran, this true story, the voice of the martyrs is a great place to pray for them. But they tell these great true stories. Padina was a young gal when she, um, she grew up uh, in Iran, and as she's growing up, she's Muslim. She said her experience of, of worshiping Allah was one of fear because they would pray, and they're trying to be good enough, righteous enough, spiritual enough to be good enough for acceptance by Allah. And so she said, we would pray often. But when we would pray, you're supposed to ceremonially wash before you pray. And she said, so I would wash. She said, as a teenager, I remember doing this, washing. And then we would go to say our prayers, and you would pray to Allah, sometimes through an imam. They're, they're holy men. And you would pray to the imam, to, to Allah, and you would do this, this kind of prayer. She said, but you had to wash first. And I would get halfway through my prayer, she said, and I realized that I, would, I didn't wash well enough. I didn't think I washed well enough. She said, I would stop my prayers. I would go back over, and almost like OCD, she said, I would just, I'd be scrubbing because the fear is driving me to be clean, and I know I'm not clean. She said, I would stop and I'd go back. She said, I would do that sometimes 10 times before I'd ever get through the prayer because the fear. She said, I had a lot of other fears, 
My mom, she said, and I, I lived with my mom even as I became an adult, but my mom struggled because she had MS, and the doctors told me that she was going to stop walking, which she did. She said, when I became a young adult, she couldn't walk anymore, and then the doctor said, it's just going to keep progressing until she dies, and there's no way that we can stop it. There's nothing we can do. So I'm fearful of my mom. I'm fearful of Allah. I'm fearful that my life will never measure up. She said, I reached a point of despair, and I went to my mom, and I said, Mom, I can't take it anymore, and I'm going to kill myself. And her mama, Padina's mom, said, Padina, if you do that, you have to promise me that you will kill me too. And Padina said, I will do that for you. Neither one wanted to live anymore. And as she began to make plans of how best to do this, and thank God, God has a way of reaching in, that there are actually gospel um, satellite transmissions that take place in Farsi, which is the language in Iran, the common language, gospel um, presentation TV shows that are satellited into Iran. And for whatever reason, her mother was flipping through the channels and comes across this gospel presentation. And the pastor was speaking, and Padina was in the kitchen, she said, when she heard this happening. She thought it was odd that her mother, uh, a Muslim, would have on this Christian um, pastor. But the pastor said something that made her stop because the pastor specifically said, he said, right now if you're listening to this and if you're thinking about committing suicide, I have a message from God for you. The Lord says stop. The Lord says call. We have a number here you can call. Call us. If you're con considering suicide, we want you to stop and call this number. Padina didn't think much about it. She was still in the kitchen, she said, but she noticed her mom got the phone, and her mom called. And her mom begins to talk to a pastor online. And she's on the phone talking to this pastor, and suddenly she realizes that my mom, she said, is, is actually praying a prayer to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, repenting of her sins and receiving Christ for forgiveness of sins and salvation. And, and she, Padina said, I almost lost it. She said, I, I ran over to my mom. I said, what are you doing? What, why would you do this right before we're going to die? Why would you do this thing that was going to condemn you to hell? You're going to go to hell now. That's apostate to accept Christ and to reject Allah. You, you, you're you're going to go to hell now. Mom, would you, why would you do that? And her mother just pleaded with Padina, please, you, you talk to the pastor too. And Padina resisted, resisted for a while. Finally, she got on the phone, and the pastor recounted this later. He said she was really cold, hard-hearted. And he said, please don't, please don't kill yourself. Please don't take your life. And she said, no, I'm going to do that. Your Jesus is nothing. Your Jesus means nothing. And he said, well, and for an hour he pleaded with her. He, finally, he, he said this to her. He said, Padina, listen, you said it yourself, that Allah has done nothing for you. Your life is filled with fear and terror. Allah has done nothing. Do this one thing. Promise me you won't kill yourself and give Jesus one chance. One chance. And Padina decided, she said, here's what I decided I was going to do. and say yes. She said, because in my mind, I would say yes to this pastor while the show is happening, this TV show is happening, and then I would be able to say in a week's time, giving Jesus a whole week, that I would call back in a week, and I would say to them, see, Jesus was nothing. He did nothing for me, and that I would take my life while on the air. That was my plan, because she said, I thought, in the bottom of my heart, I thought, maybe that will please Allah, that my last duty, my last action in life would be to discredit Jesus, and therefore maybe, maybe Allah would accept me. And she said, so that was her plan. She gets off the phone. The next morning, Padina said, I woke up because I heard noises in the house. She said, I got up to see that my mother was walking perfectly. She hadn't walked for ages. I said, she said, Medina, Padina said, Mom, what happened? She said, I, I've been healed. She said, we got to get you to a doctor. She took her mom to the doctor, to the hospital. They began running tests, blood tests. They did MRIs. The doctor comes out and he says, it's a miracle. He said, there's no sign of MS, zero sign. Your mom is perfectly well. And he said, what a mom did you pray to? 
which imam did you pray to for this miracle? And, and Padina said, I, it just came out. She said, I, I said, I didn't pray to any imam. It was Jesus. And the moment she said, I said, it was Jesus. She said, my heart changed in a moment. She said, the, the fear, the fear left. And in place of it, this tremendous faith given to her as a gift as God shows himself to be true. I want to tell you, that's not just a story. Please don't think, oh yeah, these super Christians all over the world. It's the same Jesus. It's the same Holy Spirit. So this morning, when you're looking at it, like, wow, what's happening now? Padina and her mom are leaders of the underground church in Iran. And I guarantee you this, they are still fearful. But there is something way greater than their fear. Jesus has revealed himself, and they say, oh, if we are counted worthy to suffer disgrace for the name, there's no greater thing than that because he's our greatest treasure. Oh, church, that's for us. Same Jesus, same Holy Spirit right here today. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, you know every heart here. You see what we don't often want to even confess, the fear, the fear in our lives. And God, we, to be honest, sometimes it has paralyzed us and we've frozen up. We're afraid to move. Other times, God, we've gotten angry. We've gotten jealous. We've gotten vindictive. We've used gossip. We've used all kinds of ways in which we have tried to establish our significance and God, we, we confess that that fear has led us to that and it doesn't work. God, we also know that sometimes our fear just causes us to step away, to back up because we get scared of what you might do with us if we gave our lives to you fully. And I, God, I just have this sense this morning that there's somebody here And they're afraid to take that step. So, Father, I just, I'm going to stay down here. And we're going to sing this closing song. But, God, I'm just praying for them. I don't know who they are. And maybe it's more than one. I don't know, Father. I just feel this on my heart that for them to take a step, and this is so scary to come down front here, that they're going to be surrounded by love that we are going to surround them with your love, Father, and I know you're going to meet them first. You're going to be the one to draw them, but if there's anybody here today and you have seen the blessings and there's a longing in your heart, but you are afraid to take that step, I pray right now as we sing this closing song, I'm going to stay right down front here, that you would take a step of faith and come down and be showered with God's love. So church, I want you to pray with me about that. Praise team, you're going to lead us in a song. Let's sing this with joy. Oh, I mean, God is good. He is so good. He loves us so much. And he does not want us to live in fear. But if you feel right now, you're not going to be alone. But I pray that as we stand and we sing, you don't hesitate. Take that step out. We're going to be here praying for you. If you don't come down, I'm still praying for you. We're still praying for you. But now is a day where you can take that step. Let's stand. Let's worship God this morning.
Oh, thanks, church. Um, God is good. You go with God this day and this week, and his faith, his love for you will overcome all your fear. Amen.